Welcome to uh, Worldview, the show from Hindustan Times that looks at foreign policy and uh, international affairs. And as you must be aware, one of the biggest uh, news stories in the foreign policy domain in the last few days was the opening of the Kartarpur Corridor by India and Pakistan. We have with us today a very special guest, one of India's former High Commissioners to Pakistan, Mr. T.C.A. Raghavan, who also has written a wonderful book on Pakistan, which you should read. And we are going to discuss uh, the opening of the Kartarpur Corridor and what it really means or doesn't mean for India-Pakistan relations. Um, you know, as somebody who has lived and worked in uh, Pakistan, uh, this is not a new issue. I'm sure, I mean, Kartarpur may have, you may have even discussed it at some time when you were posted there. But why did it take so long? Well, why something takes so long is always very difficult to answer. But I think Kartarpur, the opening up of the corridor, uh, has to be seen in the context of what has happened before. Uh, Kartarpur, when it was discussed in the 90s or even the 1980s, did not have the precedent of cross LOC travel. It did not have the precedent of people across walking across the Waga Atari border. It did not have the precedent of so many bus uh, services. I think all these precedents gave a accumulated confidence that something like this can be done to address a very long-standing demand of the Sikh community in India. And in fact, it's a quite a unique arrangement. I mean, for once, people are going across the border without visas, although they need to carry their passports. Yes, in that sense, this was precisely the demand that because it is so proximate to, uh, uh, to East Punjab, the, 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 the procedure of getting a visa was far too cumbersome uh, and some uh, more novel uh, method had to be uh, put in uh, place. And the idea of a visa-free corridor therefore came up in these discussions in uh, about 20 years ago. But as I said, it required the certain uh, weight of accumulated precedents to see how large-scale people-to-people movements can take place between India and Pakistan, and which is why it became possible uh, now. Uh, of course, the present context is entirely different. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to ask you about that. I mean, uh, given the fact that there's been quite a bit of tension this year, right from February, first Pulwama, then over Kashmir, were you surprised that this actually happened, that it went ahead? Well, this discussion has been going on for a year. Uh, and I was not so much surprised as interested because it's in many ways something quite new. Most of the earlier major decisions on people-to-people -people contacts, uh, the Lahore, uh, Delhi bus service, uh, people crossing the border on, walking across the border at Waga and uh, Atari, the Mirpur Khas, uh, uh, Barmer uh, train service, Kokrabar, uh, Kok uh, Munabau Kokrabar train service, the cross LOC uh, travel, all those breakthroughs happened when p things were looking up in India-Pakistan relations. Kartarpur has taken place when things were not looking up, which is what, uh, which is what uh, makes it so uh, interesting uh, and uh, in many ways uh, leaves open the question of what are the other possibilities. Yeah, coming to that, you know, I mean, if you really look at the speech that was uh, given by Imran Khan, uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, at the opening of the corridor, I, I thought it was a slightly more nuanced speech than the ones he's been making in the past few weeks, which are all about gloom and doom and the possibility of war. He, in fact, even spoke about, you know, India and Pakistan trying to be like France and Germany. But does Kartarpur really hold out some fresh hope for some kind of a breakthrough uh, between the two sides? Well, I think in India-Pakistan uh, context, uh, breakthroughs and breakdowns uh, are really two heads of the same, uh, two, two sides of the same uh, coin. But nevertheless, that this such an important uh, uh, decision could first be taken, then negotiated through, and it was not an easy negotiation from the reports which have come out, and finally implemented on the ground at a time when relations were generally uh, on the downswing uh, shows uh, that how much is possible in India-Pakistan relations and unlike the theorists of gloom and doom, you should never write off things as being, uh, you know, beyond all repair. What's your take of the current status of the relations? Do you foresee some something happening? Because it seems, everything seems to have gone totally into a freeze. I mean, even the people-to-people -people contacts that you referred to, some of the train services, yes. some of the bus services, they've been suspended or curtailed. 
Well, I think uh, things have been in a prolonged freeze since uh, January 2016, uh, from the time of the Pathan Court uh, terrorist attack. Uh, and uh, it's ironical that just a few days before that attack took place, things between India and Pakistan looked really positive because our Prime Minister had visited Lahore uh, for uh, no other reason than to facilitate the Pakistani Prime Minister. Uh, so, uh, the freeze since 2016 has continued. To my mind, uh, uh, the, the essential reasons for it uh, uh, are uh, political and these are uh, well known. Whether, uh, uh, whether something like the Kartarpur Corridor uh, suggests a thaw, I think it would be too early to say. But what the Kartarpur corridor opening suggests are the numerous possibilities uh, which exist. And as I said, one should never take the position that none of these possibilities is practical. One question that uh, has come up in the past whenever we've discussed Kartarpur and which even Indian officials often refer to is, uh, you know, the apprehension that certain elements within the Pakistani security establishment may try to misuse the corridor uh, to kind of fan separatism in Indian Punjab, uh, may try to appeal to, uh, you know, some of the pilgrims who are visiting and try to, you know, influence them in some way. How valid are those concerns? No, I would say these concerns are valid, but I don't think the concerns are of a magnitude uh, to, uh, to rule out the possibility of you know, taking political initiatives. Uh, I think because those concerns are valid, we have to devise uh, robust security procedures uh, and I'm sure these will be in place uh, and, uh, 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 and take into account the fact that uh, we have to rely on the good judgment of the pilgrims visiting, uh, uh, visiting these shrines. This uh, possibility, it's not as if this has not been there in the past. Even in the past, there used to be many reports about Khalistanis, about anti-Indian elements, about extremists, trying to use uh, the visit by a large number of pilgrims for ulterior uh, purposes. But uh, uh, many people's experience was that the pilgrims themselves were aware of it and the Jatha leaders who used to be uh, sh shepherding the flock, so to say, certainly knew how to insulate uh, themselves from uh, such activities. So I think we should devise, and I'm sure we have devised, uh, uh, proper security uh, procedures and uh, standard operating procedures. But as I said, we should not use security as a grounds for uh, denying citizens something which very evidently and very clearly they want and have wanted for a very long time. It was a pleasure talking to you as always. Thank, Thank you. you for coming Thank on the you. show.